session is being recorded and be and by participating in the session, you are consenting to the recording, retention and use of this session. Um, you wanna go on to the agenda for the day, Amanda? Sure, there we go. Okay, um, I will be doing some updates. I'm gonna try and take as little time as necessary. Um, and then there will be a panel discussion. Uh, we have uh, some local program administrators and staff on a panel, and they will talk about becoming a data-driven organization. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing from your colleagues in the field. And then um, Mary will let you know what the next the the next kind of topic of the webinar of the next webinar will be, and will um, request volunteers to participate uh, and share your information uh, with your colleagues. So um, the first update I have is kind of building on the grant update from last month. Um, it does look at this point like by far the majority of the 23-24 grants have made it through the comptroller's office. Um, one thing I would uh, like to let you know um, is that our grants are actually paid out on what comptrollers calls a reimbursement basis. Now, in the past, we have had some small grants, like the technology grants we had many years ago, where the reimbursement basis was 100%, you spent the money and then you submitted an invoice and we reimbursed you the exact amount. You know, that's not what they mean here though. What they mean is that when you get a payment, it is for kind of the, the prior month's expenditures. Um, so for example, if you get a payment in September, so for example, there were grants that were approved by Comptroller's Office prior to the beginning of September. And those agencies for got two months payment in September, not three. And that's because the September payment was quote unquote reimbursement for the expenses that you incurred in July and August. Um, and then, you know, the October payment is for expenses incurred in September. Um, those of you who got payments uh, in September had to submit a reconciliation of cash on hand report within the FAI system that was due by the 10th business day of October. Comptrollers has already processed your October payment because that is considered reimbursement for your September expenses. Based on what you submit in the reconciliation of cash on hand report, Comptrollers has a calculation where they kind of look and say, well, how much money have you received um, for July, uh, July, August, and September, or will you have received by the end of October for expenses incurred in July, August, and September? And how much will you have left over or how much will you be in the hole after that point? And then they look at a certain percentage and determine whether or not you will get a payment in November, uh, if that payment will be a little bit more, if it will be a little bit less, um, and then also for December. Um, so I, I did wanna provide some clarification on that um, because I recently got like really good clarification from the comptroller's office about how it was processed. So. If you had a grant that was approved prior to September and you received payment in September of two months, um, make sure that your agency submitted a reconciliation of cash on hand report. If you did not, you will have gotten the October payment because that was reimbursement for September, but you will not get any additional payments until you submit that report. Um, even after submitting it, comptrollers may make a decision to um, suspend payment or advance payment or give you a partial payment based on the information that you provide. If you would like to know um, 
you will need to check FAI. Um, I, I don't think the November payment information will be in FAI until, say, the beginning of November. Um, but uh, the advisors and I do not, the advisors don't have any access to FAI, and I have to work through our fiscal officer to get access, and I have to, you know, um, teams meeting with her and have her screen uh, share her screen, whereas your fiscal person should have access to FAI. So it's easiest for you to check that or to talk to your fiscal person. Um, for those of you or for those grants that were not approved prior to um, September, I believe the majority of them um, have now been processed by comptroller. So if they are approved by the end of October, uh, you will get payment in November equal to four months payment. So that is the November payment plus three months back payment, the, um, you know, for July, August, and September expenditures. Um, there is an option for something called on-demand payments. Um, that is something the division has to do. You you can't do it directly to comptrollers. The division has to do it on your behalf. Um, we cannot do an on-demand payment request until after you have received your first payment. Comptroller's office explained to me that if we would do an on-demand request before you get your first payment, that would eliminate your receiving the three months back payment. Um, so uh, the woman at Comptroller stressed that you have to get your first payment um, before we can do any kind of on-demand payment request. Um, the woman from Comptroller's also said they prefer that you submit a quarterly report before you do uh, an on or before we do an on-demand request on your behalf. Uh, she was not sure if you would be able to submit the first quarterly reconciliation of cash on hand report if your first payment didn't come until December. She recommends that after, I'm sorry, November, um, she recommends that after you receive your November payment, you see if you can do the reconciliation of cash on hand report for the first quarter. Um, if you can't, you will include that information in your email to your advisor uh, requesting an on-demand payment. Please, you know, please look at your financials closely before requesting an on-demand payment because, you know, as I noted, they, they're they considering this reimbursement. Um, so it should be for, you know, to make sure that you have sufficient funds to cover expenses that you've already incurred. Uh, the other thing to know is that if you have an excess of funds at the end of December, and then which gets reported in the second quarter reconciliation of cash on hand report that you submit in January, if you have an excess of cash, you will receive the January payment to cover December expenses, but they will suspend payment in February. So, um, we are willing to process requests for on-demand payments, um, but please, you know, meet with your accounting or your fiscal office uh, to make sure that you actually um, need it so that you're not in a situation later where you end up having payments suspended because you receive too much funding. Or from the comptroller's perspective, you have too much cash on hand. Um, are there any questions, Christine? There's nothing in the chat. Um, if anybody okay. has a question for Amanda, you can unmute and ask that now. No, okay, I'll I'll keep moving so I can get my stuff done. Uh, as always, if you have specific questions to your grants, please email your advisors and they'll work with me. Um, this is just two slides um, to give you a, a big picture around the 2022-23 uh, uh, national reporting system reporting that we submitted uh, for October 1st. 
Um, this is statewide. This is, you know, NRS reporting requirements, not how we look at agencies. Um, we had 14,893 participants. Those are the people who met enrollment status. That was a 15% increase from the prior year. Um, in addition to that, we had uh, a little over 5,500 reportable individuals, which are individuals who completed an intake form but did not reach 12 hours of service. Um, that comes out to you know, 27, over a quarter of all of the intakes that you have completed. Um, we recognize that some of those might be individuals that after they did orientation, they may have realized that right now wasn't a good time for them to do it. So not, you know, it's just some information. It's just numbers. I'm not saying that's good or bad. You know, I think it's something you want to look at. This is statewide. You want to look at your own numbers and um, kind of analyze your own numbers and, and see whether uh, though it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, are there areas that you can prove, uh, improve on or are your reportable individuals, those individuals who came in and really realized, you know what, right now is not the time. Um, I, I need to be focusing on other things. Um, our measurable skill gain for um, 22-23 was 33.3%. Our target was 35%. As a reminder, when it comes to federal reporting, um, measurable skill gains include EFL gains based on pre and post testing. It includes people who earned a high school equivalency credential during the program year, and it includes anyone who exited your program and enrolled in post-secondary education prior to the end of the program year. Um, so that is not just EFL gain through pre-post testing. That includes those people who come in and then, uh, you know, we, we hear people, you know, um, he only needed to, to do better on math and he took his GED tests and he passed, but we never got to post test him. That person actually counts as a measurable skill gain for uh, the NRS purposes. Uh, table 4B, as a state, we uh, post-tested a little over 8,000 participants, um, about, um, and only 57% of those individuals showed an EFL gain. Um, that number, in order for us to really um, meet our target and improve as a state, needs to be much closer to 70 to 75%. Um, this is a table that you can look at kind of on your on your own time. It shows the three year trends, um, you know, from kind of the low of the pandemic year of 2021 um, to 2122, which was kind of that transition from, you know, pandemic mode into kind of the new normal. And then uh, 2223, which, of course, was also the, the first year after we had the competition for uh, adult education, family literacy, and tutoring program grants. Um, as you can see, our measurable skill gain really is stagnant. So we need to work on improving that. Um, you know, I found the average hours per participant really is staying the same. You know, we really are at about 65, 66 hours per participant on average. Um, same with the number of people, the, uh, not the number, but the percentage of our participants who are post-testing, again, remaining very, uh, very similar level across the, the years. Our table 4B is pretty level and does need, you know, hopefully we'll be able to improve that. Uh, I did find it interesting that the number of individuals who participated in distance learning, which would be individuals who had at least 12 hours of remote instruction, whether it was supplemental distance learning or remote real time, all of the distance learning options, um, the number of individuals receiving or participating in distance education, distance learning um, has gone down. But those people who are participating um, increase their hours. Um, I do think it is worth noting that the people who are distance learning um, have a greater number average hours than those than 
the overall population. So the, the 65 hours um, is actually pulled up by the individuals who are participating in distance learning. Um, the approximately 50% of our students who are participating in distance learning, which means that those who are not are, you know, even lower than kind of that 65. Of course, that is an average. We recognize that there are some individuals who, you know, attend 200 hours a year, 100 hours a year who bring that number up and others who participate um, in much fewer um, hours. Okay, those of you who are, are pro on our program contact list received an email from me this morning regarding the um, surveys that we ask you to complete each year um, to provide information for Pennsylvania's annual narrative report. Um, as in the past, you will complete them in SurveyMonkey. There is one regarding your role as uh, partners in the PA CareerLink sites and in the workforce development system. And there's another one on corrections education. Um, the email included links to the SurveyMonkey. <laughs> and uh, it also included Word documents with the content of the survey. So I know that a lot of it is narrative. I'm asking you to provide a lot of information. And so we're providing the Word document so that you can use that to prepare your answers so that once you go into SurveyMonkey, you can kind of just copy and paste narrative and, and enter it quickly. And you don't have to sit there and worry about timing out or um, losing content. But we do ask that you or we do require that you submit the information through SurveyMonkey uh, that does make it much easier for us to go through um, and, and summarize and collect the information that we need for our reporting. Um, in the uh, Word document for Title II as partners, I added some notes to some of the items to provide a little bit of guidance about the detail that we're looking for. You know, this really is a chance for you to share with us what is truly happening at the local level, both good and bad, right? I mean, in some cases, there are really amazing things happening um, with you and your partners, and we would like to hear about it because we don't, you know, it doesn't show up in the data. It, you know, we don't necessarily know about it unless you report it to us. On the other hand, you may be experiencing challenges. And again, unless, you let us know about them. We don't know about them. It's not something that we can pursue with L and I if it if it's a real issue or it at least gives us context for the situation that you are in and um, what you are able to do as a partner in your PA career link system. So um, for that title two as partners, for those that I provided a note to, please. Take some time to really think about what kind of detail you can provide to us so that we can have a good picture of what's happening. Uh, for the corrections education survey, actually for both surveys, we require everyone to submit the survey, and that includes subgrantees. So if you have a subgrantee, please forward the survey to your subgrantee and have the subgrantee submit it separately. Um, if they are unable to do it and you provide the information on their behalf, you must be clear about who is doing what and which subgrantees you're responding for. But it really is easier if your subgrantee does it on their own. If you are a subgrantee and you're hearing this, uh, you will not have received the email and please request the email from your uh, from the grantee that you work with. Uh, they are due on November 13th, or by November 13th, please. Um, regarding the Corrections Education Survey, we just ask everyone to complete it so that we know that no one has missed it. 
you simply put your agency name, the name of the person completing it, and then there's a question, did you provide corrections education? If you answer no, it will take you to the end of the survey. So you don't have to go it through and add a whole bunch of NA, 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 or anything like that. Just name, I mean, sorry, agency name, name of the person completing it, and then you say no to the fact that, to the question. Okay. I am... Ah, sorry, really quickly, um, why we collect this information. Um, we have to do a narrative report, and there are a couple of items that Octay has really asked us to provide more detail about. So we have a section called Integrate Integration with One Stop Partners, and that's what we use the Title II as Partners in the Workforce survey for. And two of the items they ask for detail on is, how Title I programs are providing those applicable career services, those are the five career services um, that are allowable with Title II, and kind of details about how you're doing it, not just saying, oh, we we provide assessment, but you know, how are you doing it? Do you do it on site? Do you do it for all of the PA career link clients? Or is it only those people who are referred to you for adult education services? Is it on an ad hoc basis or are you regularly scheduled to um, do assessment? Things like that. So we would like a little bit more detail so that we have that to put into our report. Um, similar things around uh, infrastructure costs. We would really like to know about the challenges or successes you're having um, with that. And then we are, the reason I ask about relative rate of recidivism and how that's calculated, if it is, is because that's the major part of the report that we have to do for corrections education. So any information that you can get from your local um, correctional facility that you work with, if you work with them, around uh, relative rate of recidivism or even any type of recidivism calculations that they do, that would be wonderful. If they don't do anything, put that in the report because we share that as well. So thank you all very much for uh, my time. And I am going to turn it over to uh, Christine and Mary and your colleagues. Thanks, Amanda. Um, just uh, quickly, does anybody, before we start the panel discussion, does anybody have any questions for Amanda? You can um, type in the chat where I'm, I'm not seeing any uh, chat messages, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, um, now would be the time to do so. Okay, um, so now we're going to start with a panel discussion, and I am going to turn the microphone over to Mary to lead this section of the webinar. Mary? Thank you, Christine, um, and good morning again, everyone. So we have a great panel discussion this morning, again titled Becoming a Data-Driven Organization. Um, and I just want to introduce the panelists. So we have Dr. M.C. Anderson from NWIU5, Gretchen Costello from Literacy Pittsburgh, and Josh McManus from Lancaster Lebanon IU13. Um, I'm greeting the panelists and thanking them so much for taking some time out today to share their expertise and successes on becoming a data-driven organization. Um, I do want to ask the panelists as we go through um, the prompts, if you can keep your responses to two to three minutes. Um, we do want to allow for some time um, for questions from your colleagues, as well as um, update everyone on the next webinar. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, so these are questions I believe we um, gained from um, the kickoff as well as our monthly um, meetings with our agencies. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present um, the four different prompts to our panelists and I will call on our panelists um, to provide their responses to these questions. So the first question is, how do you ensure 
that your staff has access to the data they need. Um, and so I would like to start with Dr. MC Anderson. Can you provide your response, please? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so what we do is every month we download the performance reports from eData and we put them on our secured network. Each teeter, teacher has a folder um, and we put those uh, in their folders every month so that they will um, look at their current data. But then we take it one step further and we um, ask them to look at their data before we have our monthly PD meeting. And we have groups of teachers that are in cohorts and we meet with them monthly just to talk about PD. We talk about the data that they looked at and and we encourage them to look at that before we have that meeting so that we can have some discussions about um, our retention rates and so that we can have some discussions about uh, where our students are entering, the, the levels that they're entering and um, the levels that they are exiting. So. We do that on a monthly basis. Great, thank you so much. Josh? Yes, hi everyone. Um, so we work in collaboration with the Literacy Council of Lancaster, Lebanon, um, and our data practices include um, having an student management database. Um, we use FileMaker for those um, purposes. And what that does is we have we've built it um, over many years so that each teacher, when they log in to enter their attendance, which they do on this database, um, they can see our program benchmarks as a heading um, for any class session that they're teaching. So they can see average attendance. They can look at retention. Um, and then using you know that information, um, we have multiple meetings, and I apologize, my light has been going off recently. We have multiple meetings where we're looking at our program benchmarks and analyzing um, our growth areas and how we can improve. And so we look at our data in our leadership meetings and our, our PIT meetings. We have a data analysis um, team, which includes members of IU13 and the Literacy Council. Um, and having that information you know, in real time for our teachers to look at and for uh, program administrators to make decisions um, has been really helpful. Thanks. Great, thank you, Josh and Gretchen. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Gretchen Costello, Director of Adult Education at Literacy Pittsburgh, and I'm happy to tell you a little bit about um, about how we manage our data. We um, we also used a centralized internal agency database. Um, the one that we use is called Salesforce, and it's a really powerful tool. Um, this uh, tool allows us to make data accessible for all of our staff uh, to allow us to be a data-driven organization. Um, importantly, this particular database uh, enables us to track data in real time. So day by day, we know where we stand on different metrics um, related to attendance, um, our pipeline into the program, uh, our performance with uh, gains and outcomes and all kinds of different things um, to make sure that staff know how to use this tool. We train them. We spend a good amount of time up front when we have new staff training them and having ongoing training, uh, building staff skills with being able to use this. And this system um, allows us to have uh, reporting on data, um, all different types of charts, graphs, uh, widgets uh, that live on dashboards that we create for different teams and for the agency as a whole. And when you look at it, it tells you a visual story about where we are with little um, gas gauges and um, metrics, uh, charts and, and uh, different bar graphs, tools, things like that, that help us uh, see what the, what the direction of our performance is at any given point in time. And we try to build in time during team meetings to review the data re related to that team. If it's teachers, let's look at our, our team performance, uh, whether it's as a team or on an individual uh, class by class basis um, and staff and su their supervisor have one on one check ins regularly um, and they can review individual data points that are, are related to that individual. 
We have agency goals that are tied to data and we tie them to our performance in the past year and always building upon that. And um, so each individual has a, a set of goals that are, are tied to our agency goals and that helps keep us accountable. And we build all of our reporting um, internally as an agency around that. So not just setting it at the beginning of the year and forgetting about it, but having monthly uh, check-ins about where we stand on our progress with something. So it keeps us all accountable, tying our monthly reports to those goals that we set for ourselves. Um, and so all of those dashboards uh, keep us informed and we're able to use it when we're communicating with either our board or external stakeholders, partners, other funders, things like that, so that we can know what our data is doing in real time and know, know how we're performing. Great information. Thank you um, all for answering that. Um, First question. I think a lot came out of um, what you all share, very diverse. Um, and I think it would be very useful um, for some of our colleagues um, in the field. Um, let's go to the next prompt. Next slide, please. Um, are there any additional data sources you use? And I think um, all of you may have mentioned, um, but if you can elaborate on it, um, in addition to eData and the access template to guide conversations with staff about program improvement. Um, so I'm going to go to Josh first um, for his response. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in addition to eData, um, our access template, um, and our student uh, management system, we also um, look at data from our PLCs. So what are our teachers' needs? Um, our lead teachers who run our PLCs are really great at um, identifying those needs and planning for you know upcoming years as well as making um, adaptations and, and changes um, throughout. We also uh, can give student surveys, um, so that helps us to, to analyze how our students um, are doing in the program. Um, we are very close to initiating our first um, student survey to measure um, access opportunity and belonging in our program. Um, and we've been working with um, a third party contractor to develop um, questions that we can give um, quarterly to our students that will indicate their level of um, belonging in our program and, and their interactions with, with program staff. So we're excited about that. Um, we also have a process uh, with monthly data checking um, where we a report is sent every month um, that shows you know information around students with uh, greater than 60 hours who need a post test and and that helps our administrators um, keep on top of things and also communicate one on one with their um, with their teachers and we also view our finalized core outcomes reports that are are available. Um, that's really helpful in looking at the big picture of how we're doing um, on our core outcomes. We also, um, during staff uh, retreats or kickoffs, will collect staff feedback. Um, this year we had a kickoff uh, where we asked all of our staff um, to really focus on the activities they think that we should start, the activities they think we should stop, um, and the activities that we needed to amplify. And then we use that data from staff to inform our goals um, for this year. And then, you know, there's also just those conversations. Our structure is such that we have um, supervisors who have monthly one-on-one -on -one meetings with their staff, um, which can guide um, results from from data and um, improvement conversations um, and then our program administrators have monthly meetings with supervisors to kind of check in and and stay on track with with the goals and the benchmarks that we've set um, for our program great information. oh and one last thing oh, okay and i'm sorry <laughs> one, one last thing i forgot to mention um we also um investigate 
uh, you know, key areas through our data analysis team that I mentioned earlier. And so that is a really good structure because there are oftentimes information that might start to come to light when we're looking at it through our leadership team and the data team can do a real deep dive and, and consider, you know, some possible inf interventions that we could deploy. Great information. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'm going to go to Gretchen next. Thank you, and I'm glad Josh went first because he reminded me of some things that I hadn't jotted down <laughs> earlier. Uh, but here's what I can share about um, our organization. I alluded to this in my first response that we use a centralized internal database. It's a, a customer relations management system, CRM system called Salesforce. Um, that allows us to store, track, and analyze program data in real time via reports and um, at a glance dashboards. Um, it allows you to both zoom out and zoom in so you can see the big picture of how's the agency doing, how's this team doing, but also zoom in and maybe identify individual students who might need follow up and need, in, you know, unique support um, based on what the system is helping us to identify. Mm -hmm. So it's a really powerful tool and it allows us to review, reflect and compare. It also lets us see um, current year and past year data. So we see our trends not just in the given moment, but also how does it compare to past performance. Um, and it allows us to see somebody's story. So when we look at a student within that system, it's telling us their, their journey through our program from uh, inquiry through program completion, through goal achievement, so that we see that that person's journey through our program and we can kind of use that to improve our, our services uh, over time. Um, it allows us to do cross-departmental collaboration. So we can kind of all uh, work together within that system. Maybe one a person is accessing a student and using that information regarding testing while another person is accessing it uh, and looking at the student services that we might want to offer that person. So we're kind of viewing it with different lenses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, we also have our data manager providing us with a monthly data report because that system's real time. Uh, you know, it's changing constantly. It's nice to have our data manager provide a separate report that gives us a monthly snapshot. So we it kind of demarcates that the end of that month and we can compare our month by month progress uh, a little bit more easily in that case. And um, that report shares uh, KPIs, key performance indicators that we've identified that are important to tell us uh, the direction the wind is blowing at our organization and um, can, can show us some class by class data, uh, help us make good decisions with um, which classes we're prioritizing, which new classes might be needed. Um, and what Josh reminded me of is we also have um, had done some student surveying and we're using that data to help uh, build in some improvements to our to our program. Um, plus, we've done um, what we call staff pulse surveys, so regular staff surveying, which can help us, uh, you know, similarly find uh, processes that are working well, things that we want to improve upon things we want to add in the future um, and um, and gathering staff feedback on things even like our, our strategic plan. So getting that staff input is really important and we use that to um, guide our organization um, and, and um, find a, a direction for future um, uh, improvements. Great. Thank you, Gretchen, for that. And Dr. MC. Uh, we do very similar things um, at our organization as far as serving is concerned. Um, but one thing that is very different about our program is that we span across five different counties and the counties that we serve, um, we have about 400 um, miles, square miles uh, to cover. So we have uh, been kind of forced to be creative in how we uh, share the data and how we collect it. So we can't just hand students, you know, a paper survey and collect those back. So what we've done is every single class uh, has a Google Classroom. Um, and so in in having everybody on our uh, assessment, uh, on our, our assessment coordinator to um, everybody on the leadership team, 
um, is able to access that. And so we are able to post student surveys on there and we do that, that on a regular basis. And the student surveys are very open-ended so that, you know, we're asking students, how are things going? And it's not just a one and done, the, the link is always there. So if a student has a concern, and they're not comfortable talking to their teacher or they just want to talk about the program in general. Um, the link is always there and it's reposted on their Google Classroom so that that they can reach out to supervisors and administrators and so that we can without having to go hours away. Um, understand kind of what's going on in that, what good things are happening, what things we need to improve on, et cetera. And we do the same for staff. Um, and like I said, we since we are so uh, geographically spread apart, a way that we have found this year to bring them together is to form cohorts so that they have the same PD time um, each month. Um, so we have a group of teachers that meet virtually and in through in those meetings and through those conversations, we're able to gain some data that we use to, you know, form our next approach as far as um, what we are going to do with PD, what the data is telling them, what they're seeing in their classrooms, because that's changing constantly. Um, we also collect their attendance um, and have a real time snapshot uh, through Google. So we're able to monitor before we put uh, all of the data into eData. We have a general idea of what is happening in their classroom, how many they're enrolling and um, we really keep a, a close eye on uh, the disparity that we've had in the past between the served to enrolled. So we're really trying to target that this year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and have that conversation with them. Great, great information. Thank you all so much. Um, let us go ahead and move on to the next prompt. Um, so it's multiple questions in this one question, <laughs> so I'll read it very slowly. Um, what trends, pain points, and other factors did your agency discover last program year? How were these items addressed? And are they still currently being addressed? Were these items added to your PI PD plan for this program year? Um, so I would like to start with Gretchen for this prompt. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so what we were able to see within our system is uh, we were able to identify some positive trends and areas for improvement. Um, some of the positive trends we saw uh, were continual enrollment growth, uh, increased post-secondary transitions, high school equivalency and employment outcomes. So we're seeing uh, increases with those. Uh, for example, with our enrollment, we could see that we're serving 43% more students uh, and we're certainly meeting and exceeding our contracted enrollment. Um, and our, our uh, high school equivalency more than doubled over the last three years. Uh, Post-secondary transitions increased 67% and employment outcomes have increased 40%. Uh, so we're able to see the the um, the impact of our our efforts over the last three years, and um, we're able. One advantage of having a system, a centralized uh, database system like this, is that it allows us to track this information even while eData might be closed in the early uh, part of the year. It allows us to keep an eye on that and keep our foot on the gas um, even while that system is is uh, getting set up for the next year. So that's been an advantage. Um, we have identified, of course, areas of focus. So while we've had increases in our outcomes, we still have more room to go. Uh, we have to continue to focus on post-secondary transitions, for example, and our data tells us this. Um, EFL gains with our TABE tested students in particular is something that we're looking at and seeing where we can make improvements. And uh, we've identified two fronts, whether that's catching students before they might disappear uh, or maybe helping uh, inform our instruction so that we can help students uh, be more successful when they take that test. So we're using that in 
information to make tweaks and changes within our program. Um, we also keep an eye on the trends. And so, as I mentioned, our enrollment has increased significantly and we're able to keep an eye on the trends. And what we're seeing right now is just a huge influx of students coming in uh, that are interested in our services. And we want to make sure that as we get that influx of, of students that we don't um, get they don't get lost in the pipeline somewhere. So it allows us to kind of keep an eye and uh, make sure that that folks don't fall through the cracks um, as they're coming through our system. And so we're always looking at how we can improve our data flow to make sure that we don't lose sight of, of people that are interested and in need of our services. And so that data flow is something we're looking at. Um, how do we make it a better system from the student perspective, from inquiry, orientation and waiting, how do we make sure that it feels like a seamless process from their side of things um, so that we're not double collecting data or missing data along the way, that they have all the pieces and parts that, that are needed and we have what we need to be able to uh, get them um, started in the program as soon as we are able to serve them. So those are some of the things that our data system has helped us to keep an eye on and, and keep track of. And in regards to whether it's in the PIPD plan, yes, we, we've we identified that and it's something we'll be keeping an eye on throughout the program year. Um, our pipeline of data and our, our EFL gains, especially as it relates to TABE. Great, thank you so much. Dr. MC. Um, one of the things that that we have done and that we identified is that that student retention and persistence piece. Um, and I'll just briefly talk about what we we have done to address that. Um, instead of handing them the the quite large Kaplan book right out of the gate, um, we've broken up that orientation and testing time to two or possibly three different sessions, and we spend a significant amount of time. Um, making sure that we are, are triaging those barriers and we're mitigating those barriers right out of the gate and meeting those students where they are instead of, you know, putting them right into class. We are putting them right into class, but as we are doing that, we, we're slowing that orientation process down in order to speed up to make sure that they are ready to join class. And so that we are really addressing um, very purposefully the disparity that we have had in the past between that serve to enrolled. And we, we are really taking a look at, okay, so what is happening Students say, you know, yes, I'm coming. Yes, I'm going to show up. <laughs> they come in, they test, you know, we do their orientation and then they don't show up for class. So we're really trying to address what is happening um, mm -hmm. during our orientations and be and be very purposeful um, about making sure that we connect with students and that we are are doing everything in our power to make sure that they are continuously coming back. Um, and yes, that's in our PIPD plan. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah, so um, we we discovered a couple areas of focus um, through an analysis of our data last year. Um, one was we wanted to improve our EFL gains, and so um, you know by identifying um, some trends in our EFL uh, gain data, um, we were able to set a um, program specific benchmark or target. Um, for our EFL gains this year. And um, what we're doing with that is developing um, training that uh, our teachers and um, new staff are able to go through um, to really understand data and the benchmarks and what they mean. Um, because we want everyone um, to be able to analyze data and make decisions. Um, and so we're looking at building um, capacity through uh, different types of trainings that will help all staff members at all levels um, be closer to, to the data. Um, the other thing that you know, we're doing is we're looking at um, some different benchmarks for different job roles within the organization. So we have we have like program uh, goals for our instructors, and now we're doing a deeper dive for our advisement because we've identified that as an area um, with a lot of growth and opportunity. Um, so ideally, we'll have benchmarks for different job roles in our organization. Um, and our PLCs this year 
we're informed by our needs. Um, we have a digital literacy PLC um, that will help our teachers integrate digital literacy into their current practices. Um, we also, uh, looking at that EFL gain data, um, our ESL and HSC PLCs will be combined for several meetings this year, um, and they're going to be studying the five components of effective reading programs in the development of explicit reading strategies, um, because we identified that um, our HSC um, classes and our teachers could benefit from um, understanding how to teach reading, which will, will influence our EFL gain data. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and let us go ahead and move on to the final prompt so we have some time for some possible questions. Um, so for this last prompt, it asks, what are the benefits of being a data-driven organization? And are there any challenges? Um, so we will start with Dr. MC, Gretchen, and then Josh. Um, very quickly, the benefits um, as, as an administrator are to justify our decisions. Um, we use data every day, um, and that that really data-driven decision-making is, is at the heart of it. So every decision we make from our purchases to our PD meetings, everything is driven by the need and what the data is telling us. Um, I would say the biggest challenge is to to teach others um, what mm -hmm. levels of, of data analysis there are um, and to look at the data objectively and be able to come to some conclusions that are based on the data, not based on um, our feelings, not based on <laughs> anything subjective other than what is right in front of us. Um, mm -hmm. And I think by, by looking at the data first and being objective of what the data is telling you, um, then that allows you to have a very authentic conversation with teachers. Um, it, it makes the performance not about what it, uh, what we as administrators think um, it is very factual um, okay. so to be able to teach others how to do that and to be able to look at some of these reports you know it's very overwhelming as a new instructor to come in and, and hand them a table four or table four b and be like here you go um, <laughs> they're not sure how to analyze that so one of the challenges you know with inter employee turnover is to make sure that everybody understands what it means. Um, so we're really trying to focus on that um, as well this year too. Great, thank you so much. Gretchen? Sure, so uh, we have some similar themes. Uh, what we found um, as benefits, uh, yeah, we really appreciate that we have real-time access to the data, that any staff can look into our, our database and see what improvements could be made relative to their job and their position based on what's in the system. Um, and that allows for transparency of information. There's no one person who holds the key to the information. It kind of puts it out there that everyone can use that and look at what's in front of them, as, as Dr. MC said, and make decisions based on that information. Um, and so nobody's kind of holding, holding that information um, just by themselves. It creates a culture of data at our organization, meaning every day everyone's logging in and using the system and using the dashboards and reports. Uh, so it's very functional and um, it's not something extra tacked on to anybody's uh, life or schedule. You build it in and so it doesn't feel extra. It just feels like that is the work um, that, that is being done. And that helps lead to better data quality because we all want to see the best data possible and we want it to reflect the work that we're doing. Uh, folks pay very close attention and try to get it right when they're entering it. So that is, um, those are some of the benefits, but on the opposite side, uh, that data quality piece can just be challenging in general. Even though we have an eye on it, um, there's so many data points that we're reporting on that it, it's uh, time intensive to get it all right. Uh, and it takes uh, some, we have some staff really focused on that, specifically focused on that, um, that they are paying attention to data management. We have a data entry operator who has to help us catch errors uh, in our data reporting. So that that's one of, of the challenges. 
that happens with manual data entry. So um, there's a lot of training, as Dr. MC mm -hmm. referred to, a lot of training. We have to make sure that we're training new staff to, to track data well, and that can be challenging if and when you have turnover. Um, so, so it's something we're focused on. And something else uh, I would say is the balance between service and tracking. I mean, many of our staff are in this line of work because they care about students and they want to invest the time in serving the students. But if it's not happening in the system, then it's as if it never happened. And so we really, mm -hmm. although it benefits the student, we need to track that information. So finding that balance and helping staff see the importance and see how it helps us tell that story of how that impacted the student when they share that data and they enter that that in the system. So a lot of training staff getting them invested. And I'll just say, last but not least on our side, uh, raising the money. So realizing that this is an investment, that the particular tool that we used is an investment, um, creating the interest uh, around that system and helping uh, funders to see that idea as important and seeing it as transformative. It's been transformative to the way that we work and has really helped us improve our services uh, very, very holistically. And so um, it, it was work. It's a challenge but it's important and uh, we see that as a as a very um, important investment. Great, thank you for the information. And Josh, can you wrap it up for us, please? You bet, and, and <laughs> my, my colleagues uh, described a lot of great ways to be a data-driven organization. I'll just say simply, being a data-driven data organization means that you care about your students, you care about your staff, and you care about the types of decisions you make, which will impact people. Great. Thank you, Dr. MC, Gretchen, and Josh for your time sharing your wealth of knowledge and expertise around being a data-driven organization data-driven organizations, plural. Um, so here is contact information from our panel. Um, originally, Lori Como um, was going to be a part of the panel today, but she sent a great staff person in her place. Um, so you can reach out um, to the panelists here um, if you have any additional questions. I know we don't have a lot of time, um, but I'm going to turn this back over to Christine. Christine, do you see any um, questions in the chat or do we want to have someone on mute for just the last minute? A quick question for the panel. I'm um, not sure. <laughs> um, so, um, no, we just have a thank you in the chat and Gretchen put her contact information on the chat Great. since it's not on the um, since it's not on the slide. Um, I, you know, if people don't mind hanging on for a minute, I think we can take questions from the panel. If somebody has a question, um, I'll just pause here for a minute to see. I know it was a lot to take in, and there was a lot of really great information. So Absolutely. people may want to people may want to go back and listen to the recording again. Mm -hmm. Amanda, um, could you advance to the next slide? I'm sorry, oh. one after. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm going to go take, the, there's a question in the chat I'm going to take first, and then I'll talk about the next webinar. Um, in the chat, um, someone's asking, um, they would like to know what other databases program used to track their data. Um, she said, uh, you know, I know Gretchen said they use Salesforce. Josh, do you still use FileMaker? We do, um, and that's a custom designed um, database uh, that we worked with um, someone who works in our organization um, to give us exactly what we felt would be most helpful. And so we can use that software, it's called FileMaker, um, to make changes along the way as well, which is really helpful. Uh, MC, do you use anything um, outside, uh, an outside software package of some sort or another? Um, we had a a Google person, I should call him, that uh, has come up with all of these spreadsheets, and and each of our teachers have um, an attendance roster um, that is Google that feeds into this master one, and from that we are then able to it it identifies them automatically, like when they hit forty hours or when they hit seventy hours, when they need post tested, and that feeds that whole big master one um, that we're able to look in real time as they're entering um, attendance and information in their own 
um, spreadsheet. So it, it's a Google-based one to answer your question. Thanks, MC. You're welcome. Um, the only other question we have in the chat is when will the recording be available? Um, it'll be posted on PA Adult Ed Resources in a couple days. Um, we have to complete the captions and making it 508 compliant. Um, but you can check back to PA Adult Ed Resources, you know, maybe check on Monday or Tuesday. It should be there by then. Um, um, Christine, so I just wanna... can, I jump, can I jump in really quickly to talk about kind of using these these external systems. <laughs> I'm, okay, as long as, a, as, long not, as, as, long as yeah. nobody jumps off until I make the pitch for the next webinar. Yes. <laughs> okay. it, it, this will be very quick. It is an allowable expense. So, um, if you want to use some of our grant funds, it does need to be charged to your administrative costs. So it is in 2300. Uh, as a reminder, in the federal grant, you can request to negotiate administrative costs um, over that 5%. And, you know, so if in having a, a system like this, um, it exceeds, you're exceeding the admin, you would just include that in a request to negotiate with an explanation of how you're using it. So we understand it's a cost, it's an administrative cost, but we can work with you. Done. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> how do you like that when you hustle your own boss along, right, everybody? Um, <laughs> Um, so I wanted to talk about the next webinar uh, very briefly. Um, the, the structure will be the same. Amanda will provide some updates like she always does. Um, and then the topic, again, based on um, what we read in the evaluations from the uh, kickoff, um, the retention is really an issue that people um, have a lot to think about and a lot to say. Um, so we're going to put it out there, um, you know, that if anybody in the audience today thinks that their program has some really good ideas or, um, you know, has some good processes um, for increasing retention, we'd love to hear from you. You know, if not, we'll volunteer some of you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're thinking about, like, how do you utilize waiting lists? What do you do in your orientation? Do you use text nudging? How are you reducing your dropouts? Um, you know, so we really want to um, hear from you. Sorry about the siren in the background. We really want to hear from you. Um, so if you are interested in participating in the panel, please contact your advisor. Um, and we will, you know, get that together for you. I want to thank today's panelists. Um, great job, everybody. Really enjoyed hearing from you. Um, and I suspect you'll be hearing from your colleagues. Um, the fact that somebody asked when the recording would be available means that People are going to listen to it again or have their staff listen to it. So um, thank you very much. And um, I guess the final slide, Amanda. Okay. I am going to stop the recording now. And um, if anybody uh, wants to stay on, I'll stay on for a couple.